whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Hello, creeps and peepers. Hello, Dan. Hello, hello. Welcome to Scared to Death. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm Lindsay. You're Lindsay. I'm just spraying some protection spray. You're getting protected. Yeah, I'm ready. This is our 51st episode, just two weeks away from our one-year anniversary. And if you're doing quick math right now and think next week is the one-year anniversary, we we released two episodes the first week. Oh. So that's why it doesn't doesn't time out to the 52 weeks. Uh, The true one-year anniversary of the show is September 17th. Mm -hmm. Closest Tuesday night to that is September 15th. So that's when we're going to celebrate one year. So many... Yee. 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 So many little things. So many little things. So many things to keep track of, Dan. I, I was just going off, 52 episodes is a year. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. didn't You didn't tell me about all that other math. Right, right. Had a little extra math in there. Yeek. So thanks for letting us do it for that long. Uh, sweet long sleeve sweatshirt in the store today at badmagicmerch.com. Coffee, caps, and creeps is the uh, is the shirt, the sweatshirt. It's very cool. You know, I love a sweatshirt. You do. You love I to do. get cozy. And I, and I have a couple quick announcements that we don't normally do, but some stuff uh, happening. I, uh, oh, Dan. I have some stand-up news. Okay. Good news, bad news happening okay. right now. Good news. Uh, I have a new stand-up album that is available everywhere uh, that you you know get albums these days. Spotify, Pandora, um, iTunes, Amazon, etc. cetera. Uh-huh. Live in Denver. Oh, oh, yeah. That was so fun. That was a fun show. Fresh yeah. recording um, from right before COVID shut down stand-up. Uh, for a while, a lot of my favorite bits uh, perform with zero profanity, so 100% safe for everyone from little kids to your conservative grandma. Um, I, I just wanted to have at least one album mm-hmm. in, in my uh, repertoire of albums, uh, the, the canon there, that people can't complain about the language mm-hmm. or the content, uh, even though I love all that. Yeah. Uh, but, but this is the one now. So now when someone you know uh, says, like, you, if you want to like give it to somebody, you're a little on the fence. This is the one, like the gateway drug. This is the one that you give to my dad. Mm-hmm. Like you did this yep, ex- for my dad. <laughs> and, and now when anybody says like, well, if you, if you were really funny, you wouldn't have to use foul language. I can point to this album. You can hear the laughs and then I can tell them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> it's totally clean. Go fuck yourself. I love you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love you. And then, so that was the good stand up news. Bad news, following my agent's advice, and I do agree, uh, all my remaining 2020 stand-up dates are canceled. Sorry. So sorry, they, they are moved to 2021. Please contact the venues directly for refund and transfer transfer policies as they're different for every particular venue. Um, I hate to do this, but it's the call I need to make. I, I'm not worried about catching COVID and dying just with my age and kind of no underlying conditions. What I'm worried about is getting stuck somewhere. Mm-hmm. I'm worried about being away from my family, away from my studio, getting getting the you know uh, COVID and then having to go to the hospital by myself away from home and then not being able to get back home very easily because that has happened to some of my stand-up friends Mm -hmm. you know one person had to rent a private plane because they got kicked out of their hotel because they were positive they couldn't get on a domestic flight because they were positive Mm -hmm. and they needed to get home and we can't afford a private jet so (laughs) (laughs) he so so you know i i I just and and i can't with until things settle down and you can consistently uh, perform stand up the only way I've ever done it. Uh, you know, the, the only way I want to do it going forward, you know, f- with rooms, with I can see people's faces. Yeah. I can have that connection. I don't want to do stand up me. Per- I don't want to do Zoom shows. I don't want to do mass shows. It's my preference. And I'm lucky that I have podcasts that employ me and keep me busy. And I don't want to jeopardize those, this one included. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's that. I'm glad you're being safe. Thank I- you. I personally appreciate that as your co host. <laughs> Yeah, so I do apologize to stand up fans. I, I hope to see your faces, you know, next year and hopefully I can I can do stand up again the the way I love it. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. How many stories do you have today? Two. You have two. I have, I have two. Two, I have two really good ones. I mean good. they're always good, but I love these ones. Yep, you're very excited about today's. We were talking about that earlier. Yes. Um I didn't try to do this again. It just keeps happening. Uh, maybe it's the way the spirits want it. They're a little themed again today. Oh geez. And it really has been accidental. Uh mm-hmm. the first story is about the uh, they're they're both insane asylum related. Oh, okay. First story is about the tragic history and a modern encounter with angry entities in what was once known as the Oregon State Hospital for the Insane in Salem, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Second story touches on some Michigan insane asylum folklore. I'm going to share the origins of the Melonheads urban legend. 
plus a supposed recent encounter with said melon heads. Okay. I feel like you're telling stories about my future homes because mm. this show is going to make me crazy. <laughs> Are you ready for the first one? There's quite a bit of setup so you can get settled in. Yeah, I am. I just, um, our longtime friend yeah. and listener from Time Suck and now Scared to Death, Gary Howard, sent me these great socks, but I'm wearing a skirt today. So okay. this is as much as you're going to get. They're like cool. Skeleton socks. Yeah, but like x rays. It's an x ray. I don't know if you guys can see that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, founded in 1862, with construction finishing in 1883, the Oregon State Hospital, opening under the name of the Oregon State Hospital for the Insane, is the oldest operating psychiatric hospital in the state of Oregon and one of the oldest continuously operating hospitals, uh, you know, psychiatric hospitals on the U.S. West Coast. Okay. Uh, And while it wouldn't be fair not to point out that a lot of patients have been successfully treated within its walls over the years, a lot of people have also undeniably been horribly mistreated inside the long thought to be haunted grounds of this hospital. Mm -hmm. Located in Salem, about an hour south of Portland, if you miraculously don't hit any traffic, uh, countless lobotomies, castrations. Yikes. Yep. And deaths have occurred at the Oregon State Hospital over the years. And I did say castrations. Hundreds of castrations occurred after an Oregon sterilization bill passed in 1917, uh, a law passed to sterilize, quote, those feeble-minded, insane, epileptic, habitual criminals, moral degenerates, and sexual perverts. Okay. Law no longer on the books, but it was at one time. Uh, This now rarely talked about eugenics law was worded broadly enough by Oregon's legislature and societal upper crust to be able to sterilize damn near anyone. Uh, Back in the first several decades of the hospital's existence, it was also possible to institutionalize almost anyone. You could be committed for having adverse political opinions or vicious vices or uterine derangement. I don't even know what that means. It it basically was this carte blanche for if you just said that you're any woman, wife, mother was just, quote, acting crazy. You could be committed. I would be so fucked. In, in 1896, two of the four most common grounds for admittance were masturbation and intemperance, a.k.a. drinking too much booze. Oh, I that's it. I'm commit, <laughs> commit me right now. <laughs> Grown children tired of waiting for an inheritance could and did commit elderly relatives. Uh, men whose wives wouldn't grant them divorces would have their wives committed. Controlling parents whose children didn't do as they were told had them committed. So many people were wrongfully imprisoned. Placed in a prison full of actual criminals, people actually suffering from real mental illnesses, the intellectually disabled, and others also locked up because they were seen as a burden, embarrassment, or just some type of obstacle. Uh, And for years, sterilization was a common prerequisite for release. Men were surgically castrated, and women were given forced hysterectomies for years. Oh, my God. God, that's all its own horror story. mm -hmm, Some patients died during these procedures. Thousands of others were given crude lobotomies. Yeah. Uh, They would go on to live most of them kind of. Doctors would take sharp ice pick like instruments such as the orbitoclast, insert it above a patient's eyeball in the top of their eye socket, tap it with a little metal hammer hard enough to break through a thin layer of bone, and then the doctor would twirl this device around in their brains, severing important frontal lobe connections. And then the same barbaric procedure would be repeated via the other eye socket. Uh, One of these full transorbital lobotomies would take no more than 10 minutes. Very crude. The the results of this surgery, quote unquote, were, as you can imagine, pretty mixed. Uh, No one was ever the same after one of these procedures. I mean, how could you be? Yeah, how could you be? Sometimes personalities were permanently changed. Sometimes inhibitions, empathy, and a variety of basic intellectual functions related to being able to live on one's own were altered or even destroyed. Sometimes patients were turned into vegetables, completely catatonic afterwards. Sometimes patients died. Uh, The most common widely reported long-term side effect of this procedure was significantly decreased intellectual functioning, often described as mental dullness. I mean, duh. Yeah, the the ice pick lobotomy was uh, more medieval torture than it was a surgical procedure. Uh, In addition to sexual and brain mutilations, there were also uh, or have been, you know, numerous allegations of rapes and molestations over the years dealt out by both uh, staff and other patients. My God. Former patient Kelly Darcy sued Oregon State Hospital in 1992, claiming she was molested repeatedly by a psychiatric aide. She said... I was sent to the hospital because I tried to kill myself. I was in far worse shape when they discharged me. 
It didn't take me long to find dozens of other allegations printed in various Oregon newspapers, and these are just from recent years. How many violent crimes occurred in prior decades when these crimes were reported far less frequently? Uh, there were so many potential victims. At its height, the hospital had over 3,500 patients, and over the years, thousands have died within its walls. In 2004, state investigators found thousands of these dead. They uncovered what was called the Room of Forgotten Souls. What the fuck does that mean? It was a room in an abandoned portion of the facility. In this room were roughly 3,600 urns, each containing the ashes of an unnamed patient. What? Yep. How is that possible? How did all of them die? Records don't say. How many may have been murdered? Victims of botched operations or worse? In 1942, nearly 50 patients may have been murdered in a single day. Whether th uh, through homicide or negligence, uh, they certainly died. Their deaths came as a result of an accidental poisoning incident. An incident Oregon's governor at the time, Charles A. Sprague, referred to as a mass murder. On November 18th, a group of nearly 500 patients ate a dinner that came with scrambled eggs and fell severely ill within minutes. They fell to the floor, suffering from leg and stomach cramps, vomiting, trouble breathing. Soon, many were vomiting blood. The cafeteria became a gory spectacle as hundreds, mo hundreds moaned and bled. 467 patients became seriously ill. 47 died. Forensic examination determined that instead of powdered milk, sodium fluoride a deadly insecticide used to kill oh. cockroaches was mixed into the scrambled eggs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was ruled accidental. Accidental. But was it? What kind of kitchen keeps powdered milk next to poison? No one ever went to trial. A lot of bad things have happened at the Oregon State Hospital in its over 130 years of operation. And not surprisingly, with this kind of history, many think the hospital is very haunted. I will say it looks like the kind of place that would be haunted. Definitely has a classic creepy asylum vibe, full of long corridors, creepy concrete floor, basement patient cells, full of torturous looking equipment, such as chairs patients were strapped into. There's dimly lit surgical rooms where God knows what abominations were performed on how knows who knows how many people. Uh, also tunnels under the hospital with rooms rumored to have been used to conduct horrible experiments on patients. Rooms where no one would ever be able to hear them scream. Oh, God, this is awful already. Visitors have reported hearing the ghosts of these patients still calling for help. There have been numerous reports of footsteps, wailing, whispering, apparitions opening and shutting doors, even actually touching visitors and staff. The following is the most intense report of paranormal activity I was able to find coming from the institution once named, again, the Oregon Host State Hospital for the Insane. The author posted their paranormal encounter anonymously. For more effective storytelling purposes, I will refer to them as Michelle. Okay. Time now for a tale I'm calling What's in the Tunnel. In the 1990s, Michelle worked for the Department of Corrections Central Administration, located in the Dome Building on Salem Center Street. This building was once part of the Oregon State Hospital, part of what's now called the Oregon State Hospital Historic District, and it was connected to a neighboring building by an underground tunnel. The Department of Corrections was renting the building from the mental hospital. It seems to still be the department's headquarters. Over 20 years ago, Michelle worked on the first floor and would often use the women's restroom located down the right hallway from the front entrance. And this is where her experiences all began. Michelle frequently worked late and was often the last one to leave the building by a good hour or more. On several different occasions, when Michelle was in one of the restroom stalls, she heard what distinctly sounded like someone else in the restroom. She'd hear paper towels being taken from the receptacle, and then the sound of the towels being used to wipe someone's hands. She'd hear a faucet being turned on and then off, and another stall door being opened and shut. She once even heard a toilet flush, but she shouldn't have heard any of this because no one else was supposed to be in the building. Fuck. No one else seemed to be in the restroom when she'd walk in. No one else ever seemed to be in the restroom when she walked out. Worried about intruders, she eventually talked to security and was told that the security cameras hadn't detected either anyone else entering the restroom shortly before Michelle or leaving the restroom shortly after. Cameras hadn't picked up anyone coming into or leaving the building in general when Michelle worked alone late. Not surprisingly, she started to feel a little spooked when she was working late, and she did her best to avoid working late alone going forward. But one winter night, there she was again, working overtime, completely by herself. For what would be her last time, Michelle was the only person in the building. 
And when she walked down the hallway to use the restroom before a long, 40-minute drive home, something above her caught her eye. She looked up and near the very high ceiling, roughly four stories high, were several dark, orb-shaped, small, cloud-like objects swirling around. Mm -mm. Michelle felt almost hypnotized by them. She didn't initially feel any fear. Not yet. And then after staring at these orbs for roughly a minute, she proceeded to use the same restroom where she'd heard strange things many times in the past. Oh my god. This night, after flushing the toilet, as she began to pull up her underwear in her stall, BOOM! She heard one of the other stores, st stall doors violently slam shut. The force of the slamming shook the rest of the stalls. After a moment of two or silence, Michelle heard BOOM! A second stall door slam shut. And then moments later, a third. Her stomach sinks. She double checks to make sure her own stall is locked. She breathes as quietly as she can to listen for more sounds. It's eerily silent. She begins to slowly lower herself to the stall floor where she can peek underneath the divider to find out how many other stalls are occupied. And just when her face nearly touches the floor, suddenly all the stall doors fling open at once, including her own just locked door. A moment later, all the sinks turn on and Michelle can see what looks like scalding hot water pouring out from them. Water that begins to steam the lower portion of the bathroom mirror, and the steam soon reveals a message. Oh, boy. She can just make out the finger-scrawled words, Why did you hurt us? Oh, God almighty. Beginning to feel true terror, Michelle quickly leaves the bathroom, only to encounter the shadowy orbs again. They're now floating at her level, suspended between her and the door that led to the parking lot where her outback was parked. She feels trapped. She, she begins to panic. The orbs swirl around and transform into what looked like the outline of a human face. And then she hears, seeming to come directly from the orbs, the same message she just read. Why did you hurt us? A door that Michelle had never used before then flings itself open down the hall. And Michelle feels strangely compelled to walk towards it, to enter it. No, 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 no. She said it felt like she'd been placed into some sort of trance. She actually didn't want to enter the door. She wanted to run to her car, but down the hall she walked. Once through the door, she walks down some stairs into a basement hallway that leads to another door that opens on its own, one that leads to a tunnel. Eek. She really doesn't want to walk down into the tunnel. She says the air smells musty and rotten and wrong. But enter the tunnel she does. Heart pounding, she wanders down the dark corridor, led by the powerful feeling that she must continue, and eventually she makes it to an old room under another building. She turns on a light she didn't expect to work and sees old medical equipment laying in disarray all around her. Uh-uh. She's looking at the remnants of lobotomies, shock therapy, castrations, hysterectomies, hydrotherapy, God knows what else. Equipment used for forced ice baths and for voltage to be pumped into a strapped down patient's brain with little understanding or care regarding how much it would hurt them. Orbital picks and various saws and scalpels lay on a steel preparation table. And then the orbs come back. She hears the same voice coming from them, with more, with more anger this time. It was like a psychic scream that went off like a bomb inside her head. Why did you hurt us? The lights flicker and the orbs begin to swirl around frantically before she hears the voice again, this time more of a whisper. This time the voice sounds frightened. Hide. He's coming. A door slams open and then shut again from further down the tunnel. The sound and a feeling associated with whatever is in the hall finally snaps Michelle out of her trance. She hears footsteps. It sounds like they belong to someone big. Someone walking briskly. It sounds like they're pushing some sort of cart or maybe a wheelchair. She can hear the squeak of its rusty wheels rolling unevenly on the floor. Michelle begins to run. She runs as fast as she can back towards the dome building. She can hear someone following her. She imagines whoever it was grabbing her, restraining her, dragging her back to the surgery room. She imagines being cut into and probed and violated in a variety of heinous ways. It, it feels so incredibly real what she's imagining. It feels like someone else's memories have been forced inside her head. Michelle runs faster. She runs up the stairs, back into the hall that led to the exit near the bathroom, and then she freezes. What appears to be a real teen girl is standing in the hall by the door. Michelle had planned to open this door and use it to flee outside. The girl staring down at the floor, hair over her face, wearing some type of old medical gown. Oh, God. As Michelle stares at her, she can hear whoever was following her down the tunnel quickly coming up the stairs. No, no, no. Go, 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 go. The girl looks up and locks eyes with Michelle. Michelle can barely see her face as she slowly walks backwards or towards both her and the exit, quickly glancing over her shoulder backwards every few moments towards the door that led downstairs, towards where she could hear something quickly approaching. The girl Michelle stares at whispers in the same voice she'd heard from the orbs, Why did you hurt us? 
Michelle stammers, honey, I, I didn't hurt anyone. I didn't even, and then more of the girl's hair moves away from her face on its own, and Michelle sees the face of pure rage. The girl now yells in a much deeper and more powerful voice, why did you hurt us? And then with a smile, he'll tear you apart. With that, Michelle stops staring and runs for the door. Go, 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 Closing go. her eyes, she passes right by whatever this girl was. The door opens and she runs outside. She briefly thinks about returning to at least no. lock the door and instead quickly decides she'll call security when she gets home and tell them about having problems locking it. She runs to her car. She speeds out of the parking lot faster than she'd ever left it before. And while she didn't quit and never return, she did never stay late again. If she had any extra work to do going forward, she came in early. Anything she couldn't done, get done by quitting time, she took home. Over the following few years before eventually moving to Portland and landing a new job, Michelle heard several other employees tell stories of working in the building by themselves. Other employees told tales of hearing doors slamming, keys rattling, lights turning on and off, and she thinks at least one other employee had an encounter with the same spirit or spirits that she did in that same bathroom where the horrible night began. Michelle asked him a few questions about his encounter, but when she brought up the girl she'd seen before running out the door, he suddenly didn't want to talk about it anymore. Michelle couldn't blame him. Outside of writing down and posting this account, she doesn't want to talk about it anymore either. Mother of God. Yeah. Yeah. Creepy one, right? Oh my gosh. I really, really felt that. Like deep in my stomach. I have a tummy ache. Ah. Check out, Ugh, this is not going to make it better. These pictures. Okay. Uh, this first picture, and these pictures, by the way, what we're going to be- What the fuck is we're, that? We're going to be putting these pictures, uh, they'll be out on Instagram going forward uh, when the episode drops. So okay. for, for listeners, um, yeah, yeah, you can just check out this for all of our audio listeners only. You can check Instagram and Facebook at Scared of the Podcast to see these pictures. This first is a early 20th century lobotomy kit. So that's that oh, little hammer I was the, talking about. The pick in the Mhm. And that's the uh the, the basically an ice pick. A medical ice pick. Yes. I would like one of those for my birthday. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> I would never sleep if you, I knew you had one of those oh in your side of bed. Oh my god. I would never sleep if I knew I had that. This next picture is a diagram of how this thing worked. Just sticking that thing up into somebody's brain very ah. crudely. This went on. Thousands of people had this done across America, and I'm sure many more across the world. Do you? Do they pull the eyelid forward and then go up underneath yep. it? They just go up underneath your uh, eyelids and then just right into your brain with that little hammer. They hammer a pick into your brain. That literally makes me sweaty. Like I'm oh, like, it's terrible. Whoa. It's terrible. Okay, fine. Whew. Okay, this next picture, late 19th century uh, artist sketch of the hospital when it first opened. Uh-huh. Big and scary. Big, big and, yep, big institution. Uh, recent picture, this next one, the Oregon State Hospital's main building. I mean, classic, like, asylum, like, out of a horror movie. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there's nothing you can tell me to not make me think that that's a creepy fucking building. Right. Uh, well, this next is creepy. This is one of the many <sighs> underground rooms. Get uh, out of here. Just where no one could hear you in a room like that. Just it, big, just, thick, concrete walls. I know that Ugh. that's like rust on no the walls. No windows, yeah. But it just feels like blood. Like blood, yeah. Uh, this next one's an underground hallway. <sighs> that's, uh, uh, no thank you. No, no thank you. And then this is this one more picture. A super creepy underground hallway. It's just like, there's so many pictures of this place. We're like, ah. Uh, just uh, different like lighting. That, that green glow. Yeah. Water piling in the corners. And then before, so I don't forget. Piling, pooling. <laughs> random trivia about this. The Oregon State Hospital was actually used as a location for the 1975 Jack Nicholson film, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh. Mm -hmm. The book the film was based on was set inside this same hospital. Well, I mean, do you need more explanation than that? <laughs> okay, so, <sighs> you know, our studio mm -hmm. is in a shared office space. Mm-hmm. And every time I go into that fucking bathroom, yeah, I'm like, oh, I, I, I literally am always like, look at like, okay, what, what there's no one else in here. Mm -hmm. I do a little like check, but there are so many times that I'm in there that it just, especially when we're working late, no one else is in the building. Do you remember? It wasn't that long ago that I made you oh, come yeah, I came into th the women's bathroom uh -huh, with me. Uh huh. Because I, I was, remember. I don't know what I was reading or working on that night that had me <laughs> spooked <laughs> out. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but that bathroom actually. When you did the Annalise Michelle time suck, mm -hmm. that was the beginning of me feeling uncomfortable in that bathroom. Uh. And ever since then, it just never feels good to me. I don't like to be in there by myself. Yeah, I have a whole system in there. It's rather embarrassing, but. <laughs> well, I, 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 I do have a question for you. Yes. Did, did that girl win her lawsuit? 
Oh, like, uh, in the oh, setup, you know do you what? know? The, I, I don't know, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I believe she did. Sarah something, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh-huh. and, and uh-huh. there was, and I didn't want to go too heavy on that part of it, but what was crazy sure. is there was, you know, I mean, there's, there has been a lot of patients, you know, coming out, but there were, that was one of many lawsuits. So, and, and, and yet and that's, it's and still like, open and... Well, it's still open. It's state ran. So it's like, you know, and, and I'm sure there were people that were fired. There was different things. I mean, I know there were from reading some of that. There were people charged. People sure. went to jail over, you know, different things. But I just think like all the articles I found were like the 90s going forward. That was going to be my next question. Mm-hmm. They were all like, you know, quick, and, and back, you know, in the 20s, 30s, 40s. I mean, it's so sad to say, and this next story we're going to talk about touches on this, but people were seeing, and I know this from doing a lot of time check research on, you know, asylum related topics. You know, a lot of people were seen as very disposable, mm-hmm. and they were and they were put in these asylums, like all, all the urns full of ashes. Yeah, and their families one hundred percent completely abandoned them, never came to visits. They put them there, and they never ever checked on what happened to them. Yeah, and then the people knew this, and they, these people would just die in there. They would be thrown in mass graves. They would be in, put in unmarked graves, just thrown in urns. There was very little oversight, yeah. very little. So God knows what used to go on. Yeah. And and then just one other question before we, we go forward. So you said that that law about like all, you know, you could be. Eugenics law, the, the 1917, the sterilization. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when was that overturned? I don't know that. I mean, I, it, it, I know that there was a national, and this gets rarely talked about. Eugenics is mostly associated with the Third Reich, with the Nazis. Mm-hmm. And what people uh, don't want to know or don't, I mean, maybe just aren't taught is that prior to, well, prior to World War II, there were eugenics movements all across the Mm -hmm. U.S. Oregon wasn't an anomaly. Right. A variety of states passed eugenics laws and to sterilize people considered, quote unquote, feeble minded. Mm -hmm. But it didn't stop there. You know, it went to like, you know, homosexuals and, you know, just a variety of people. I think it's an attempt to weed out what they consider to be the weak yeah, yep. or right it so they were the, trying to build their own perfect right race. it was it, it was generally religious moralists yeah. who anybody who wasn't part of their religion mm-hmm. and, and and wasn't living accord, according to their subjective morality yeah they wanted to be sterilized yeah crazy well, crazy maybe crazy. that's a future time suck dan it, yeah yeah no absolutely. moving on that was a long digression i apologize <laughs> i just there were so many it's a lot of stuff in that one things on that one that you know we can discuss later uh are you ready for a story even more insane and arguably scarier than that one okay sure uh we tell a lot of weird stories here on scared to death this next one it may be the weirdest one so far okay to the diehard skeptic every story we tell here on scared to death defies you know the limits of credibility i understand sure. that uh if you flat out just don't believe in the possibility of ghosts demons cryptids extraterrestrials and extraterrestrials etc i mean hey why are you here uh but also yeah you're <laughs> yeah. not yeah you're not going to believe in any of the stories that we would tell here but even if you do believe in a lot of our reports of encounters with the paranormal you still probably aren't going to believe in all the stories we tell some of them are going to be for you well I believe all of them. <laughs> For me personally, folklore accounts of creatures like the Wendigo or the Eight Foot Tall Woman or more modern digital-based folklore tales like Jeff the Killer, they're the ones that are the hardest for me to take seriously. But that's just me because based on creep and peeper feedback mm-hmm. – these are some of the scariest tales we've told for many listeners. Yeah. I know the Wendigo story in particular freaked my sister Donna out big time. It did. Mm-hmm. Really scared her. Uh, obviously, a story that's seemingly more far-fetched than normal to me doesn't mean it can't be real. Right. Doesn't mean, you know, or have roots in reality or still be terrifying. It's all subjective. And I just bring all this up because, as I've hinted at, this next story is pretty out there to me. Okay. But also very interesting and terrible and sad and scary if it's true. Uh, I have a feeling it's going to really creep some people out. So here we are. Uh, have you ever heard of the urban legend of the melon heads? I feel like I have, but maybe I'm just wanting to be a part of that club that knows what you're talking about. Based on where you're from, uh, I, I would think maybe you have at some point. Accounts of the melon heads come primarily from two places, or actually, well, two, and then there's a third kind of one, but uh, Michigan and outside of Cleveland, Ohio, specifically from the little suburb of Kirtland. Oh, yeah. And then Connecticut uh, are the three, but mostly Michigan and outside of Cleveland. So what are the melon heads? Well, there are two main legends regarding what they are, how they came to be. And the first comes from Ottawa County, Michigan, a county that butts up against the western edge of Grand Rapids. And according to this legend, in the days before proper medical care and assisted living facilities, children born with hydrocephalus uh, were sent to live at the now long closed junction insane asylum in the late 1800s 
or according to local lore, story variations, the Dunes Correctional Facility. Now, hydrocephalitis, uh, or hydrocephalus, excuse me, there's no itis in there, hydrocephalus, sure. sorry, occurs when cerebrospinal fluid accumulates in the brain and children born with hydrocephalus sometimes have swollen heads, sometimes pretty grossly swollen. Okay, uh, so water on the brain. Mm, yeah, fluid. Yeah, fluid around yeah. the brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and 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 it can disfigure facial features pretty substantially. You can just you just end up with a very large head, especially like the um where you, the upper okay. kind of portion of your head. Yeah. Um. Today, hydrocephalus can usually be successfully treated by an operation in which a shunt is placed in the brain that draws out the excess fluid. Okay. Decades ago, century ago, sadly, of course, this sure. didn't exist. Children afflicted with this condition were often, as I spoke to kind of earlier, tragically abandoned. Dropped off at large, overcrowded facilities full of poorly paid and poorly trained caretakers. Mm -hmm. Out of sight, out of mind. Uh, they were just forgotten. Yeah. And, and for years at the Michigan Asylum, these children endured, according to this legend, psychological and physical abuse. Given shock therapy, forced to stay awake for days, dunked in cold baths, experimented on in a variety of cruel and unusual ways to determine if they could be made, quote unquote, normal. The more they cried or protested during these torture sessions, the less they were treated like human beings, the more they were treated like disobedient animals, they were punished, and the more they were punished, the less they looked and acted like humans. According to legend, after many uh, cruel years of incarceration, these patients, these children, became so feral they were uncontrollable. They lashed out against the staff, fought with the staff, became harder and harder to treat, and the asylum lost its funding to keep treating them. And as the story goes, without the money to keep them because their families didn't want them back, the asylum chose to release them into the woods as if they were animals. What? They thought the strange looking children might live uh, wild for a while and then in all likelihood die off once winter came or they ran out of food. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. But they were wrong. Despite most thinking they would soon die out in the elements, the melon heads built rough shelters. They survived. They reproduced. They continued to survive and reproduce, foraging off of raiding dumpsters and cabins and eating berries, roots, animals, and fish, living in these, uh, you know, just in the wild between their medical conditions and incest. Children were born more and more disfigured and they seemed by all folks folklore accounts less and less human as generations wore on. Okay. Some believe they still live in the woods of Allegan County, Michigan today. So that's one legend. The other primary account, primary account of how the melon heads came to be come from the suburbs of Cleveland. It's an even sadder tale that begins with some healthy orphans. I say sadder, different kind of sad, maybe more appropriate. Okay. Uh, both very sad. One day, a man known as Dr. Crow came to a local orphanage he told the caretakers that he was setting up a practice in the area, always wanted children, but since he'd spent so much time in school and then working, he'd never married and started a family. Sounds fishy. Mm -hmm. They let him adopt three children, and they were never seen again, or at least never seen again looking like themselves. According to this legend, Dr. Crow wanted the children not to raise and care for, but to perform cruel living experiments on. Similar to the previous asylum story, Dr. Crow tortured these children for years with strange treatments to satisfy his own sadism and disturbing scientific curiosity. Eventually, the children became hairless creatures with malformed bodies, weak, emaciated to the point of looking skeletal. Finally, one day, the orphans decided to fight back. One of them proposed to the others that while they were too weak to pull this off individually, they were strong enough together to kill Dr. Crow. That night after Crow went to bed, the orphans wiggled out of their restraints, and while two of them held the doctor down, the third slit his throat and then proceeded to stab Dr. Crow over and over until he was most certainly dead. Victory! Mm-hmm. After killing Dr. Crow, they then destroyed his house of horror, setting the home on fire. Good. And retreating into the nearby woods, police figured that eventually the children would either die or turn themselves in, and they were wrong. These children had already learned how to survive on just the barest of resources and in the grimmest of circumstances. And according to this legend, these children were never heard from again for decades, and then Melonhead sightings began to be reported more recently. To this day, they allegedly, they allegedly live in the forest near Crybaby Bridge, surviving on animals and maybe occasionally murdering someone who ends up on a missing persons list. Uh-huh. And now that we know the basic, most common origin legends, let's get to today's recent supposed encounter. Time now for a tale called Attacked in the Woods. Tony was driving down uh, oof, Chillicothe Road in Chardon, Ohio, a little 5,000-person town 30 miles east of downtown Cleveland. You got those all correct. Okay, good. Uh, when he saw him, now 18 years old and a senior in high school, Tony would heard stories about the melon head since he was five, and now he couldn't believe his own eyes. He was impossibly watching one running alongside his car in the ditch by the road. 
He was driving down a section of road with farm fields on both sides with an irrigation ditch separating the road from the fields. That's where Tony spotted him. He looked out his window and realized all the stories he'd heard growing up about the melon heads were true. Tony was amazed. He must have been running almost 30 miles an hour. He was wearing ripped brown pants and a white shirt with a few red stains. Tony estimated he was around 5 foot 7, light brown skin, a large head, two holes where his ears should have been. As Tony's car rounded a curve in the road, the melon head jumped out onto the road. Tony swerved to miss him, jumped the ditch, crashed his car, slamming it into a muddy embankment. Shocked but uninjured, he did a quick survey of the land around him and the melon head was nowhere to be found. He slowly got out of his wrecked car. And still scanning the area around him for the melon head, he also surveyed his Honda for damage and could tell there was no way he was going to be driving himself home. He didn't think there was any major structural damage to the car, just a smashed up front bumper and mashed grill he knew he could get parts for from a scrapyard, but he was stuck too deeply in the mud to get out on his own. So he called his buddy Paul instead of calling his parents. He'd rather have them not know he'd gotten into a car accident if he could help it. At least not right away. Paul's old Silverado had a winch and should be able to pull him out no problem. Paul answered the phone. Tony told him the whole crazy story. Paul laughed about the melon head sighting and asked Tony if he'd crashed because he was drunk or high. <laughs> and then as Tony started to explain how he was 100% sober and not hallucinating and for sure had, I know, I know, just seen a man who looked exactly like the stories they'd heard his children, Paul heard his friend cry out in pain. Shit, Tony yelled. Ah, I'm bleeding. Someone just threw a rock and hit me in the fucking head. Tony spun around and saw the man he'd seen running alongside the ditch, now standing next to a tree, oh, 30, boy. 40 yards away at the edge of some woods that butted up against the farmland where he crashed his car. Tony told Paul to hurry. He had to go. Then he hung up the phone and started to slowly walk back to his car. His initial plan was to lock himself inside and wait for his friend, but then he saw two more melonheads step out from behind some nearby trees. He froze in his tracks and thought maybe sitting in his car wasn't such a great idea. They could smash out his windows, they could break inside, then another rock hit him, this time in the side of the neck. Tony fell to his knees. He felt where the first rock had hit him and his head was warm and wet, blood. Also, his neck was now throbbing. Dazed, he looked behind him and there were two more. They were surrounding him. He had to do something fast. He wanted to run, but he remembered how fast the one he saw by the ditch was. They would catch him for sure. Maybe being trapped in his car and waiting for help was his best or only bet. He raced towards the door, and the first melon head he saw popped out of the trees, bolted after him. Tony was barely able to get inside before he slammed into the door. He quickly locked it before he began to pull at the handle. He pulled hard. He was so much stronger than he looked, and the car rocked back and forth when he tugged at the door handle. Soon the others, five in total, ripped against the other handles. One jumped up on the hood and pounded his fist against the windshield. Tony called Paul again. Paul! He yelled into the phone. Paul, they're going to kill me! Call the police! Tell them to hurry! Before Tony hung up the phone, Paul heard him say, Oh my God, no! And then there was a crashing sound. A second melon had climbed up on the hood and Tony could see he was carrying a large rock in his hands. He lifted it over his head, then smashed it down against the windshield with everything he had. It shattered the glass, but didn't quite smash clean through the window. No more than two seconds after the windshield was shattered, another rock smashed into his rear passenger window. The glass was completely shattered. Oh, boy. One of the melon heads then used a fist wrapped in some sort of rag to punch against the remaining glass fragments while the melon head on the hood lifted the rock off the windshield and then smashed it back down again. Tony screamed for them to leave him alone and then honked his horn as the melon head that had just punched out the glass started to now climb into the car. With nowhere to go, Tony knew he had to fight to survive. He twisted around and punched the melon head in his face as he screamed and then grabbed his arm. It slithered back outside his car and tried to drag Tony out with it. He gets pulled into the back seat as the creature on the hood now uses the rock to completely smash through the rest of the windshield. Tony's crying. He knows he's going to die. A second melon hood grabs his arm and now two are pulling him outside the vehicle. A piece of jagged glass slices into his ribs as he's pulled through the Ugh. busted window. With a thud, he hits the ground. He's outside now and the two melon hoods that pulled him from the car still have a hold of his arms. A third now grabs his left leg. He thrashes to get away, but he can't break free from their grasps. The other two descend on him as he throws punches with his free arm and tries to kick. He screams out in pain as he feels teeth gnash into his hip. He hears fabric ripping as one of the melon heads tears his shirt off. What he doesn't hear any words, just grunts. As he continues to thrash about, he's terrified that at any moment a rock like the one used on the windshield will smash down into his skull and kill him. Luckily, that doesn't happen. Suddenly, the creatures holding him let go and look down the road. Before passing out from blood loss, Tony hears the rumble of an approaching vehicle. And then everything goes black. Tony wakes up into the hospital around eight hours later. 
his parents, little sister, and Paul all there. His parents tell him that the driver of a county road grader found him laying unconscious in the ditch beside the road. Tony, of course, asked his parents if the driver saw the melon heads. He didn't see anyone. Tony's parents wanted answers, as did the police. Tony couldn't give them the answers they wanted. Who really did this to you? Enough about the melon heads. Tony, this is serious. Are you in trouble with someone? Five years later, Tony says that still no one believes him, not even Paul. But he knows what he saw, what he felt, what he heard. He knows what happened to him. The tale of the melon heads, is, melon heads isn't just an urban legend to him, not anymore. Tony thinks they're still out there hiding in remote areas away from the society that shamed them, tortured them, nearly killed them. And if you ever see one, Tony thinks you should head back the way you came as fast as you possibly can. I mean, I basically think we're never camping in that area. <laughs> like ever, ever. Also, I am holding in a sneeze like it's no one's business. <gasps> no, oh no. Do you need to let it out? I, I don't know. I, like, I think I fought it, it off. Comes? But okay. if okay. I'm mid-talking and all of a sudden I just, okay. that's why. That's why. Uh, here's a artist depiction of uh, the melon oh. head. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, I know that should be a creepy photo, but it actually makes me really sad. I know. It, it's a sad story. It's one of those ones, like, it's an it's an urban legend that obviously has some scary elements to it, but, yeah. the, but the base, the root, the origin of it is incredibly sad. Right. Uh, second sketch of uh, a melon head, and that's just, again, some artist depiction. They're popping out behind the trees. Right. And then this third one, uh, this is the rare, this is a melon head dog. Yeah. Now, for those just listening, mm-hmm. this is a um, this is somebody's dog where they've they've cut up a watermelon and used it as a helmet, and it is one of the most adorable pictures. <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of like a watermelon Dutch boy haircut. It is. That is hilarious. It's like the kingpin. Yeah, kingpin, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> kingpin haircut. Um, Randy Quaid's character. I'm blanking on his name, but it's that that guy's haircut. On Very a, funny. On this uh, dog. So I, anyway, I needed that. I needed a palate cleanser. Okay, good. Thank you. But crazy story, right? Yeah, I mean. I feel like interesting maybe, urban legend. Yeah, I feel like maybe I heard about that when I was a kid. I wanted to ask you, Crybaby Bridge. Did mm-hmm. we cover that? Mm-mm. No, we there was another I've never, bridge. I've never talked about that bridge. I don't know. Uh, have you heard of that bridge before? I have, but okay. we've talked about previously. Oh gosh, some bridge or tunnel somewhere. I cannot. Mm-hmm. The episode is escaping me. That we talked about here is a story that you told, and I think it's like. I don't know if you would go there and you would always see something in this tunnel or this bridge. Oh, there was a tunnel with the bunny man. Urban the bunny legend. man. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. So for a second, I was like, wait. Uh, yeah, Crybaby Bridge. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why I know that, but I think maybe just, you know, colloquial kind of story where I grew up. I mean, I'm just pulling this out of my ass right now off the top of my head, but I believe that the bunny man legend was Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. So it's not that far away no, from where this all. legend originated. They're all kind of in the same area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crybaby Bridge. What happened to Crybaby Bridge? I don't know. There's a reason why it has that name. We're going to have to look into that. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, it, it sounds familiar from to, my to from my childhood. And, you know, also it's like when I was a teenager, my friends and I would all be, you know, trying to scare each other. Sure. So I'm sure that in the passing of tales, that came up at some point. Crybaby yep. Bridge. Yeah. Yeek. Well, I mean, that was really sad, but also, I mean, I just feel like with modern technology, mm-hmm. you would think that if if someone really thought there yeah, were groups of humans living out in the woods, right, like a geothermal heat map would mm-hmm. uh, help you find them. Right. Just, and you could say that about any cryptids, really. I mean, there's that. Um, but this one but, more than most. But yeah, different because a cryptid. Yeah, not, yeah, you're right. Not a cryptid. This is kids. This is this is like generations of kids. That's why I said, that's why I preface this one. Like, it's different. This is out on the very edge yeah. of what I would choose to talk about. But I do like for, for the sake of variety. And, sure. you know, this is one of those ones where I think you could hear it and be like, yeah, whatever. And then all of a sudden you're out in the woods. Oh, yeah. It, it pops back up your brain. Like, ah, oh, God. Oh, God. I'd, I'd totally be freaked out. But yeah, because as sad as it is, I mean, if you saw... Uh, some feral type humans coming for you in the woods, you're not going to think like, oh, this is so sad. You're just going to think like, please don't fucking kill me. Correct. Yeah. I can't believe his family never believed him. I mean, theoretically, he might have bite marks in his hip. Oh, yeah. So how do you justify that? How do you explain that away? Just a group of random people. I mean, anybody could do that to you in a fight, I guess. I guess. It's, I mean, it's him adding that extra dimension of like this urban legend. Because I can also understand his parents being like, dude, come on. Right. Stop come lying. On. That's a What'd you do? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of drugs were you on? <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. Boy. Oh, boy. Well, you've got a squishy? I got my squishy. Squishy, squishy? Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, I got Layla. <laughs> 
Oh, Layla, does she still smell like cookies? Yes. Good. Mm, smells delicious. <laughs> Don't eat her. <laughs> she's deal. she's not for consumption. Okay. Well, I've got two stories now. This first story, uh, this I, I love this story because it ties together to me. Like, if this happened to you, the the be, the setup of the story, yeah, I feel like I feel as though you would have the same reaction as this person of like, okay, this is complete and utter bullshit. Mm-hmm. And then years later, when it comes full circle, wham, truth. Okay. Right. You're okay. Gonna, like, I just think it's it's really good. Okay. Hey, King and Queen suckos. <laughs> I've been a longtime fan of dance comedy and the Time Suck podcast. Yay. Thanks. This week, I had to drive cross country twice in six days in an effort to relocate to Missoula. I love Missoula. Yeah, we, Missoula. we both love it's Missoula. the bomb. I hope mm-hmm. you go hike the M. I finished the entire Scared to Death podcast back catalog. I've never had an appropriate venue to share this story until now. It is 100% true. About 20 years ago, I was a young man in Northern California, fresh out of high school, and I was dating a young lady that I probably should not have been. (laughs) She advertised herself jokingly as a witch, and I was more horny than intelligent at the time, so I didn't pay much attention. I grew up in a Christian household, and against my better judgment, I pursued a relationship with her. She asked me to join her at a Wiccan festival one summer, and I reluctantly agreed. At the time, I thought that I didn't have any right to judge her beliefs if I expected her to let me have my beliefs. Agreed. Agreed. And and still agree. Yeah, absolutely. At the festival, we walked into a tent where people were doing aura readings. When I walked in, two people who were in separate corners of of the tent with their backs to the entrance, who did not see us enter, both stopped what they were doing and immediately, but very slowly, turned around to look at me. One of them got up and asked me if I knew how old I was. It seemed like a silly question for obvious reasons, but I just said no. The person indicated that he believed I was a very old soul and had led a troubled life previously. He then proceeded to tell me that I was a leader of a small village on a riverbank and had fallen in love with a young maiden on the opposite side of the river. I had lamented on the fact that I could not gain access to her. He went on to tell me that I proposed a plan of riding a horse across the river when it was at its lowest point. My mother and other family members in the village begged me not to do this for it was certain suicide. Eventually, I decided to do it anyways and, as predicted, was met with my death. Mm. I politely nodded at the gentleman and smiled and thanked him for his time. (laughs) I remembered in great detail the story that he relayed to me in my teenage years, but I don't think I didn't think of it often. Fast forward to my 30s, and as fate would have it, I was dating yet again. I met a very attractive young lady in Wallace, Idaho, and we ah, became I love Wallace. <laughs> it's great. And we became quite enamored with one another quite quickly. For several months, I did what all people who are quickly falling in love do. I ignored lots of red flags <laughs> because certain activities were just so much fun. <laughs> After 3 or 4 months of dating, the red flags began popping up more and more and with massive frequency. I decided to separate myself from the relationship. One evening after the split, the young lady came to my home and told me she did not believe she had the strength to lose me again. I wasn't sure what she was referring to, so I just let her speak. She alluded to having known me in a previous life and loving me with all that she was and that she was not prepared to lose me again. I asked her to please expand on that thought so that I could better Mm -hmm. understand where she was coming from. She very calmly and with certain eyes said the words, I had to watch you drown once and I will not do it again. I stared at her in disbelief and did not say anything. She then added, you were so stubborn then and you have not changed. You would think that you would have learned to listen to your family and friends. After changing my pants for obvious reasons, the girl that I had been dating relayed word for word, detail for detail, the exact thing that the man at the Wiccan Festival had told me over 20 years prior. Weird. She even paid close attention to the markings and colors of the horse I had supposedly been riding when I drowned. I still consider myself a devout Christian, but I also consider myself intelligent and capable of rational thought which means I take every bit of information that comes to me into account regardless of the source, and I make every attempt possible to use critical thinking skills to analyze it. Mm -hmm. I have no explanation for this. Your nomadic friend. That's pretty weird. Isn't that weird? I feel like if you went to a Wiccan festival 
and someone asked you how old you were, like you would have the exact same, like, okay, let me, you know, humor this person. Sure. But then if years later, 20 years later, someone who didn't know that story comes back to you and, and relays it verbatim. Right. How the F is that possible? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know that it's, I mean, like it, I mean, my brain wants to be like, did you mention some of this to her or something? But, it, but he, he would remember that. Of course. And, and, and if you really didn't share in this information with somebody and they told you those, ex- those cause that, that's so random mm-hmm. to, and then to relay those same very specific details. I don't know what, how, what I would make of all that. It's very peculiar. I, I think I, I'm sure he's going to think about that off and on for the rest of his life. Absolutely. And I, I love that he even calls himself out as a devout Christian because it's mm-hmm. like he's letting us know that, you know, it goes against his right, this is not part of his belief system. core beliefs. Right. Yeah. Interesting, right? That's That's going to mess with his head for, forever. I think it's going to mess with my head. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Was a, that was a good, like, different tale. Just like uh-huh. makes you want. Yeah. Just speaking to, like, what else is out there that mm-hmm. science doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for one more? I am. I like that one. Yeah. Okay. So this I, mean, is, I like them all, but yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know. I thought that one was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is an interesting story also out of Michigan. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to Michigan. Mm-hmm. So our writer starts with, hello, and thank you for reading my story. A little bit of background on my neighborhood. We were one of the first families to move into a new subdivision built in 1969, 1970, about 20 miles from Detroit. Our yard was nothing but lumps of dirt and clay. And when my dad was leveling and digging out the front yard, he found many Indian arrowheads. As a seven-year-old, with the imagination of my friends, we pretended that cowboys and American Indians fought there, never actually realizing that we could have been right. There were plenty of American Indians and settlers, just not cowboys. (laughs) Fast forward to the mid-1980s. My older sister bought a house in the same neighborhood. I moved in with her and her husband as he works the night shift and my sister didn't like to be alone. So here we are, just the two of us, hanging out one night. I was sitting in the living room when I heard footsteps coming down the hall. I just assumed it was my sister and without looking up, I said something to her, but she didn't answer. I repeated myself, but still, she didn't answer me. I then looked up to see no one was there. How weird. I had clearly just heard her walk down the hall A couple minutes later, my sister comes walking through the front door saying that she had been at the neighbor's. Was it my imagination? The same thing happened every night. There would be the sound of footsteps coming down the hall, but then no one would be there. I wasn't the only one who heard it either. Mm -hmm. My dad heard it happen as well. We all started joking that there was a ghost in the house. Over the next few weeks, other strange things started to happen to me. Every time I was in the kitchen and I would hang up the hand towel, it would mysteriously and inexplicably fall down. Even if I made sure it was hung up evenly with no reason to fall, I would hang it up, turn around, and I would hear it fall to the floor. Weird. So peculiar. Items started to disappear. The TV remote disappeared for two days. We tore the living room apart and could not find it anywhere. And then one morning, boom, there it was, just lying on the couch. And of course, the footsteps continued. Every night, footsteps. One evening, my sister and I were in the kitchen and the hand towel fell to the floor yet again. I looked up my sister and said, you know that one day we're going to look up and a ghost will just be standing right there staring at us while I pointed to the laundry room door. I made a face at her all silly-like and we shared a good laugh over the made-up scenario. During the summertime, we would have all the windows open. At night, I would put on a fan in my window to get that lovely summer breeze that lulls you to sleep. One night, I was awakened by a rustling sound, like papers being crumpled. We had just gotten two kittens, and so I assumed it was just one of them getting into a bag in my room. I opened my eyes and saw someone walking out of my room. I thought it was my sister looking for the kittens in my room or something of that sort. I laid there, waiting to go back to sleep, when a girl walked, no, rather stomped, into my room, stood at the foot of my bed, turned towards me, and then stared at me, making the exact same face I had made at my sister just a few nights before when we were joking about a ghost in the kitchen. It was like she was mad about me mocking her, and so she was mocking me in return. She then turned around and started to stomp out of my room, only to turn around and make that same face at me again. Mm -hmm. She kept doing this little routine, like a child throwing a fit. 
She would stomp a little bit on her way out of the room, then turn back around and make this smirking face at me. She kept doing this over and over, inching her way out of my bedroom until she walked through the door entirely out of my room. I was petrified. I thought, if she comes back in here, I will surely die of fright. (laughs) I laid there not moving and oh so scared. The next thing I remembered, I was waking up in the morning and jumping out of bed. My parents were visiting, my parents were visiting, and I was hysterically telling them what had happened. My dad, oh bless my dad, as he calmly listened and then proceeded to describe the girl in great detail. Oh my God, that's always the worst. Sorry. Young, maybe 15-ish, dirty blonde hair, bloomer type looking pants that came to her knees with a matching shirt, angry, dirty face. I was about to shit my pants. My dad had seen her too. Considering the way she was dressed and her dirty state and the area of the home, we decided that she must have been a settler who had been killed at a young age, maybe by the American Indians. We aren't too far from Fort Detroit. To this day, I still spend the night at my sister's house for the occasional sister's weekend. And to this day, I feel a presence in her house. I haven't seen anything or anyone, but I know she's still there. At night, if I get up to use the bathroom, I refuse to look up. I keep my eyes down and make a mad dash to the bathroom. I am certain that one night I will see her yet again. All of my life, I have seen, heard, and felt things, but this girl was the scariest thing ever. Thanks for your time. Love your show. Deidre, sometimes a creep, sometimes a (laughs) peeper. Yeah, thanks, Deidre. Yeah, those... Those are the stories that get me the most on the credibility level and then Uh just like that, ah, shit, where there's so many examples of one person sees something, they're like, oh, my God, please let that be my imagination. (laughs) And then somebody else is like, hey, did you see exact details of what they saw? Uh Uh-huh. And and, and I'm sure there are some occasions where someone, as I kind of like mentioned before, just didn't remember sharing details before, but every time, no fucking way. No way. And and again, like I kind of like we said at the very first episode of this series, it's like if just one of these is real, like what a weird door that opens. And like this, this, I just don't know how you explain that. How else do you explain that? If like two people see the exact same thing that isn't real, Mm -hmm. that's so creepy. So creepy. I love that this supposed ghost or whatever she is, I love that she was like mocking her. Like, oh, yeah. Dun, 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 you right, know? <laughs> like, right, right. You know, it, it, I don't even know if she's like creepy or scared. I mean, it sounds like Deidre is scared of her. But I, I mean, I would just be scared to see anything. Yeah, But yeah. the ghost itself sounds pretty harmless. Right, right. There was that weird, the remote thing. <laughs> I, I, I just jotted down a quick note. That just made me think like... um. I mean, a lot of times these these ghosts, like, obviously they scare us, you know, like that when people see them, like, it's, you know, that's the main emotion, obviously, is just fear mm-hmm. associated with that. Even if, like you just said, even if the ghost isn't necessarily doing something scary, like, if, the, okay, let's, so let's say this ghost is real. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean, it, like, and it's scaring people. That doesn't mean it's trying to scare people. We don't right. know what's going on. But then I think, like, there's a lot of stories where they do try to scare people, obviously. Mm-hmm. And then when that remote was hidden, I was like, well, what if some ghosts just want to, like, prank you? Right, like, what if like, they just want to have some fun? Right, right. Yeah. Like, is there, there's no, like, rule against that. Right. I, I was just thinking, like, <laughs> how funny slash annoying that would be <laughs> if, like, you constantly can't find your car keys. I'm missing two things right now. Do you think a ghost your, hit your it? Your Raycons are gone and something else. What's the other Yeah, thing? my Raycons are MIA and a yeah. pair of um, eyeglasses, my favorite eyeglasses. <sighs> and I just saw them within the last week. Like, I know they're around. I've scoured the car, my backpack, like, my work backpack, right. my desk at home. I cannot find these items if i was a ghost i would totally want to do that to people right well and, and like you were saying like moreover to your point about why do they necessarily have to be like scaring us or not right. that's like saying like all people are good or all people are bad it's right. like why can't ghosts yeah. or spirits or whatever you want to call them have their own personalities yep. just like we do if the if the ghost game so to speak is real we don't yeah. know what the rules are right it could be there all, are no rules right right but yeah it could, yeah exactly there could be no rules yeah Lots of interesting things. To think Lots about. of interesting things, Dan. Yes, I have a couple things I'd like to say. Okay. One. I like to say things. I I do. I want to hear do. them. I like to hear things. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. One. Happy anniversary to Dallas and Seth, celebrating two years together and are engaged to be married. Yay! Yay! I hope that your wedding wasn't planned during quarantine. Oh man. I know a lot of stress for people. Yeah. So sending you love and just mm-hmm. a couple um happy birthdays. Okay. Happy birthday to Amanda from Hezekiah. Happy birthday to Dan, not this Dan. Okay. From your brother Jason. And happy birthday to Zach from Jennifer, plus a little Hail Nimrod for you, Aww, Zach. Oh yay. 
And that's all. You know, and happy anniversary to you. We didn't do that. We didn't mention that on the show that we just had our anniversary. When this episode comes out, it'll have been like two weeks prior. But we had a very nice anniversary. We had a very lovely anniversary. I thought, I thought we both did a really good job this anniversary. I thought we did really good. Mm-hmm. I hid. Dan and I weren't together. It's our mm-hmm. four-year wedding anniversary, eight years together. Mm-hmm. And I hid four cards around the house because we weren't going to be together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we do like the traditional, uh, like we see what the traditional gifts mm-hmm. are. We- so weird. Year four, fruits and flowers. Mm-hmm. But we did fruit and flowers. We did fruits and flowers. Or... You could go the modern way and electronics. Yeah, electronics. So yeah. weird. But we, got, we're... but we got flowers. We did flowers. We did um, chocolate covered strawberries. For each other without the other one knowing. So mm-hmm. cute. Very cute. It's very and, cute. And the cards. Yeah, it was very, very nice. I got I got Dan a cactus because he's prickly. It seemed better than flowers. <laughs> see more see more appropriate. It does. It does. Well, happy anniversary, baby. I love you. Oh, I love you too. Yeah, you're okay. Good. Good. You're all right. Uh, so, so getting out of here, thanks again for the reviews uh, and the ratings recently. We, we just found out, um, we posted on socials, but just recently we were the number three uh, most listened to podcast on all of Pandora, which is very exciting. Very exciting. I started uh, to do an inappropriate hand gesture. <laughs> Switch my game up. Sorry about that. Yeah, we've had a, we've, we, it's been really, really nice where it's like there's been that, there has been uh, on the charts on Spotify. Uh, we, we were on the playlist, a spooky playlist on Spotify yeah. for, for many months. And uh, listenership has really been growing, and, it, and it's a tough time right now to grow listenership Yeah, with people's listening habits being changed, and we're very thankful. So yeah. th- thank you so much. Thanks big, to Pandora. Big, fat, thank you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's all for today. So thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales uh, of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com, and for emailing us for, uh, for anything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Nailed it. Thanks to Logan and Kate Keith on social media, badmagicmerch.com. Uh, producer Sophie Evans for helping with story curation. Joe Paisley, Zach Flannery for producing, directing, custom soundbed creation. And Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Follow us on FB and IG. Ooh. Mm-hmm. If you want more content, uh, at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, with over 5,000 horror-loving members. Thank you to Liz Hernandez for moderating. And that's a wrap, Creeps and Peepers. That's it. Enjoy your nightmares. Hope you were scared to death. Bye, y'all. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death.